Hello, welcome to Philosophy Roulette 159, where we read philosophy and review it live on air. So, you know, I could look at the new one, the uh, new papers, but you know, I was thinking we might do something different today because just what's in the news. Let's check out some philosophy of race, some top, one of the topics that I know very, very little about, and so all new to me, really. I might have read one book on it you know, a long time ago, and I was terrible because I basically don't know a whole lot. So, but seems like the thing to do at the moment. So, hmm. Aha, just stuff. Genealogies of terrorism. Revolution, state, violence, empire. All right, why not? Contemporary political theories, take a look. One to five, I always like one to five. Let's see if it's available. Uh, oh, it's a review. No wonder it's only one to five. It's Hellenism and Orientalism. Reflections on the boundaries of Europe in an age of austerity. Yeah. So, treating the Greeks as uh, some sort of foreign nation. Back to the future of black struggle in theory and practice. Hmm. More contemporary political theory, it looks like. Uh, let's take a look at this. Uh -huh, another review. Whoa, what just happened there? Very strange for a sec, but no big deal. Alright, so not this. Mm-hmm, let's see. Uh, now I'm getting worried about uh, this con that contemporary pith political theory just put th put out a ton of reviews and all of this stuff is a review. That's uh, too bad. If it is, let's just take a look quick. Yeah, J. Reed Miller. Because mm -hmm. we did the, um, what was that? neoliberalism and sort of race relations in that uh, philosophy of film paper from a few days ago that was fun um, nice paper because I got to talk about it exactly I'd seen the movie uh, District 9 how to achieve reference to covert social constructions Studia Philosophica Estonia so that would be kind of cool categorical injustice what is that kind of social philosophy let's see Oh, let's take a look. This might be uh, good to go. Let's see if I can actually... Oh, no. I hate you people. Let me download the PDF. Oh, maybe it did. All right, so we're going to talk about Categorical Injustice from the Journal of Social Philosophy. I guess an Asta. person's name is Asta. All right. Um, yeah, just Asta. All right, that's cool. I haven't had a single, not a two-name person. I've had a, this is the first time I've only had a single-name person by Asta. That's different already. So... Let's see, what do we got? Um, the link is now in the chat for all the people that are here currently, and if you are watching later, it'll be, uh, well, if you show up later, you can always type exclamation point paper in the uh, chat, and it'll pop back up, or it'll be, the link will be below the show notes to get back to this page here, where you can just uh, get it uh, from the link. Okie dokie, so... Categorical Injustice by Asta. Some of the most exciting research in philosophy in the last couple of decades has been work at the intersection of theoretical and practical philosophy from a feminist perspective. 
The work I present here is in that vein, as it lies at the intersection of metaphysics, feminist philosophy, and social philosophy. In my recent Categories We Live By, I presented an account of the construction of social categories of individuals. These include sexes, genders, and races, but also any other category defined by social property, such as refugees and single mothers. In this essay, I will address a specific way in which such social construction can involve an injustice that is distinctly metaphysical. I name this sort of injustice categorical injustice. And it occurs when an agent, excuse me, when agents are systematically thwarted in their attempt at performing actions by how they are socially constructed. This reminds me of the uh, Miranda Fricker sort of like epistemic injustice. So this is categorical injustice of a, of a more metaphysical, not epistemic uh, stripe. The conferralist account of social categories. The central idea in my theory of social categories is, the is that individuals get conferred onto them a social status in context, and this status consists in constraints and enablements on their behavior. These constraints and enablements are what results in categorical injustice, given, that certain, given certain conditions. I offer a theory of how these constraints and enablements are put in place and the mechanism by which they result in an injustice. But this is looking a bit ahead. Let us get a sense of the conferralist framework first. We, ha we all have various features, and some of these features have social significance in the context we travel. These features we have vary. Some of them are physical features, others relational, some even, some even themselves social. For example, I am 168 centimeters tall, I have moss green eyes, breasts, and broad shoulders. I am also the daughter of... I'm not going to attempt to read that, those names, it looks sort of uh, Scandin like Northern European. Um, because that looks like a Sven Einer, Einer, some like Swedish or something. No idea though. Oh, Icelander. And a native speaker of Icelandic. Some features only have social significance in very specific contexts. Having a short pinky finger, perhaps. Other, like a Dr. Evil. Others matter in most contexts. Sex assignment, perhaps. The key question is, what is it for a feature to have social significance in a context? The intuitive idea behind the theory I offer is that a feature has social significance or meaning if people treat you differently when they take you to have the feature. I make this bit a more uh, I make this a bit more precise by saying that a feature has social significance in a context in which a person gets conferred onto them a social status if they're taken to possess the feature. So, for example, being female is socially significant in a context in which people taken to be female get conferred onto them a social status. The person may, in fact, not have the feature. They only need to be taken to have it. The social status consists in constraints and enablements on the individual's action in the context, which means that certain actions are available to them and others not, as compared to, to if they were not taken to have the feature. For example, if you are taken to be female at a summer party, you may not be invited to operate the grill. I mean, there's plenty of women chefs now, so. But yeah, it seems in America, at least, it's sort of a guy thing to be the uh, grill master. <coughs> I make a distinction between two sorts of categories, two sorts of contexts, and two sorts of features. Institutional and, I, and what I call communal. Institutional contexts are contexts governed by a set of rules or laws, for example, laws governed governing driving in California, or rules governing the activities of dolphin swimming and rowing club in San Francisco. The entities that confer status on a person in these in those institutional contexts have the requisite institutional authority to confer the status in question. For example, a license to drive in California is conferred by an official Department of Motor Vehicles upon judging the person to meet the relevant prerequisites. <laughs> I've been to California. I don't know if they have any prerequisites. <laughs> I'm sure they say they do <laughs> for driving. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think there's an age limit. A person is conferred the status of member of the Dolphin Club by the president of the club upon being taken to meet the membership requirements and having been elected by the members present at the monthly members meeting. People have the status as long as they remain in the context and it does not get revoked. The, profi the profile of institutional properties is like this. Conferred property P who, a person or entity or group, an institutional authority, what, their explicit conferral by means of a speech act or other public act, when, under the appropriate, appropriate circumstances, in the presence of witnesses at a particular place, etc. Base property. The property the authorities are attempting to track in the conferral. The individual need not have the property, they just need to be taken to have it. Yeah, it's in the eyes of the uh, conferrer, not necessarily 
uh, property of the individual. Uh, that makes sense. I call the conferring of an institutional status on an individual an act of classifying that individual. Classifying an individual is an act of placing them in an institutional order. The other sort of feature, the communal, is of more interest to the project of this paper, although institutional and communal conferrals can interact in a variety of ways. A communal feature is also a social status conferred upon a person in context of in a context on the basis of them being taken to have a feature that is socially salient in the context. The status consists in constraints and enablements, just like in the institutional contexts, but these constraints are not deontic. They do not concern rights, privileges, and obligations, but power, sway, and non-deontic restrictions. For example, being tall may be a socially important property in a context, and people taken to be tall deferred to in making decisions for people in the context or allowed to speak more than others. Yeah, um, in the U.S. politics recently, um, Andrew Yang, who uh, is taller than a good number of other the candidates, he's not a short person compared to, a, what was it, uh, Mayor Pete Buttigieg. But they had made Yang smaller than him in, in some of the graphics. And it was like, well, if you're going to be accurate about representing the candidates, you should at least make them the right height. But they're known to be people who are smaller are taken less seriously in that sort of context of uh, like m a media graphics and so it was a conscious decision by somebody to actually not get his height right um, so it makes a big difference just being tall um, in that sort of a way okay being knowledgeable or not about a particular subject may also be a socially significant property such that if you are not taken not to be knowledgeable no one will listen to you to what you have to say the yeah, so this is the Miranda Fricker up here is that uh epistemic injustice you are not your knowledge doesn't count the base property for the conferral of a communal property can vary as in the institutional case yeah and like i said before my knowledge in this area is woefully under uh yeah i guess lacking so if i say anything <laughs> my apologies if it's just very bad i i am trying the base property for the conferral of a communal property can vary as in the institutional case. C consider, for example, a party where people are interested in who is and is not married, which makes the salient make, makes that a salient property in the context. Perhaps they are looking for someone to marry and they do not want to get entangled with people who, who already are. In a different context, that may be precisely what they want. Yes, I once got yell criticized for because i said aren't you married why are you talking to like why are you this interested in me and then one of their friends was like what do you care if they're married i was like oh i guess not it's none of my business yeah they were a little too interested in me at that point uh, so it's more than just friendly but i was made me confused alex is legally married but he does not carry a wedding ring and acts as if he is not Yes, he is like, what am I criticizing that person for? At the party, Alex gets conferred upon him the status of eligible by other people at the party. This is so even though he is already married. At the party, he has the communal status of eligible and various people flirt with him because he has that status in the context. Let us suppose now that friend, a friend of Alex's, Sammy shows up at the party and is enraged at Alex's acting as if he is not legally married. Sammy tells some people at the party that Alex is already married, and after many a whisper, Alex loses his communal status as eligible in the context. People may even feel hurt or betrayed by his acting as if he were not legally married. The profile for a communal property is thus following, thus the following. Conferred property P. Who? A person or entity or group with standing. What? Their conferral explicit or implicit by means of attitudes and behavior. When? A particular context. Base property property the conferrers are attempting to track in the conferral consciously or unconsciously. The individual need not have the property, they just need to be taken to have it. Yeah. Yeah, eligible is an interesting one. I mean, I definitely, it is, it is of a definite, definite social value to know in a group who is and is not. Like people who are looking for someone who are not looking for someone, makes it can make a big difference in a social setting. Okay, the conferral of a status in the communal case is an act of placing a person in a context-specific communal order. It is important to note that what we have here are two distinct properties, being legally married and being presumed to be legally married, and the corresponding being legally not married and being presumed to be legally not married, which we have labeled eligible. Yeah, see, the problem I got confused with was someone was legally married, but they were also eligible. Uh, my apologies. 
being legally married and being legally mar legally not married are institutional properties, and Alex has the former if he had if he has had that status conferred upon him at a prior date. Being presumed to be legally married and being presumed to be not legally married are communal features. They are social statuses that get conferred, conferred upon Alex on the basis of his being taken to have the relevant institutional statuses. They consist in constraints and enablements on his behavior and with them come norms for behavior for Alex and for others engaging with him. For example, it would not be appropriate for Alex to be flirting outrageously with people if he is presumed to be married. Similarly, it would not be appropriate for others to flirt excessively with him. Let us now turn to the content of the constraints and enablements from where they derive. Okay, so... The author has set up a... Uh, two sort of uh, system where there's two institutional and then social constraints. Um, calling it communal. So it's communal and institutional. Um, I think, I mean, they have a whole book on this apparently, but I mean, I'm just trying to get it straight on the distinction here. And uh, it just seems the communal ones are much more relative and then the institutional ones are much more fixed to a sort of a, a standard. And that's why I think they called it deontic earlier. Um, so you've got some sort of universal standard, granted it's institutional based of some sort of uh, stable institution, but the uh, communal ones are relative to a uh, very, uh, specific group that is more fluid. So it's uh, just sort of the social context at that time. So it's the communal one. So it's more uh, temporal as opposed to institutional based, which is the institution is sort of like persisting through time. The communal one is not persisting in the same way. Okay. Placement in categories. In the case of the institutional placement of individuals, which I have termed classification, the constraints and enablements are deontic. These are rights and privileges, duties, and so on that come with the particular roles assigned and are encoded in laws, rules, and regulations. Their particular content was agreed upon by the relevant parties when the laws, rules, or regulations were instituted. The story in the communal case is more complicated. Here there are no laws or rules that describe the constraints and enablements that come with the assigned status or role. Where does the content of these constraints and enablements come from? I consider them to have ideological sources and our habits, practices, as well as narratives and the like contribute to them. I mean to use the notion of ideology in a neutral way as not inherently bad, although it often is. The epistemic component of an ideology are especially important here as they include stories, concepts, narratives, and assumptions that we use to make sense of the world around us and often to justify why the world, the world is as it appears. Generalizations about people and things play a larger role large role here, including stereotypes and prejudice. What is of particular inter interest to us here is the is assumptions about the groups of people or stereotypes about groups. These assumptions are part of the ideologies that we live with and the set of intelligibility conditions for the actions of the people we interact with. I am going to follow Aaron Be Beagley in thinking of stereotypes and stereotyping in a descriptive way. Then a stereotype is a set of features associated with a group and stereotyping is attributed to one or more of the stereotypical features of a person who you, you take to be a member of the group. There are other uses of stereotypes and stereotyping, but this one is the one which is most relevant to the construction of social categories. It is important, however, that the act of stereotyping, as I am using it, need not be conscious. In cases I am interested in, it is not a conscious act of judging a person to have certain features on the basis of judging them to belong to some group. So, okay, so we've got a not, it is not a conscious act of judging. So it's sort of, you're just sort of going on, um, not sure what, all right, I'm sure they'll say, but it's not judging. So it's not a conscious act of judging, or maybe it's an unconscious act of judging. But I mean, I don't know yet. Um, now, there's the question of like stereotyping and then just like, law of averages like if you see somebody in a location um like if i see someone in a rich neighborhood i might assume they have money now is that a stereotype or is it um it, or is it just the member of the rich people group because they are in a rich neighborhood i mean depends what features we're talking about so we'll have to see The, so the social map in the particular context consists in several parts. What roles there are to play in the context, who plays what role, and what are the expectations of each role. What roles there are to play is partly determined by the material and institutional circumstances. 
For instance, a car is stuck in the snow in the Sierras and people want to get it unstuck and get back on their way. Given the material and technological circumstances, there are two roles to play, driver and pusher. But who is to play what role? That can be partly determined by institutional and material factors too, but stereotypes can play a role there also as who is seen to fit each role will partly will be partly a function of what features the people are taken to have and that in turn is influenced by the use of stereotypes. In our example there are four people, three of whom are licensed to drive. One of the three is a woman, who is one is a very large man, and the third is a young boy, and the fourth is a frail man. As is clear, these are, these are roles they assume relative to each other. The question uh, is who of the four people is going to drive the car and who to push. Here we can imagine a stereotype kicking in. Men are strong and good at pushing cars. Women are weak and not good at pushing cars. The woman ends up driving the car while the two men and the boy push the car, even though the woman is stronger than the frail man and he also, and he also has a license to drive. And the, in the negotiation of who plays what role in this case, stereotypes regarding men and women kick in kick in, in the assignment. Yeah, I was going to say put the old man in the car because you don't want that man to get injured. But again, that one might hurt his pride as a man. And so he end up with the women driver, even if it's not um, based on just the woman being weak. Um, like the appearance, the uh, stereotype of the woman being weak. I do want to put one thing out there. This has nothing to do with the paper, but... In 2007 or 8, there was a terrible storm here in New York, and like there was just snow up to the uh, cars were getting blocked in. It was bad. And I was over by NYU, and I was actually, my thanks to Hartree Field, I was sitting in on one of his courses. Um, but I leave, and there was a woman blocked in. She was like in a car, and she couldn't get out. It was like a beetle. And so, like, I'm not a big guy. I'm 5'4. I don't know what that is in a metric. I'm sorry. But like, it's not tall. <laughs> I'm on the short side. And so I go over to push the car. And like, just as I get to push the car, like these four huge guys show out of no, up out of nowhere. Like they were like a few steps behind me or something. But like, I go in to push the car and then like these giant guys all show up. <laughs> and we push the car out. And we got the uh, classic, I love this town from the woman. Like she puts her fist out the window. I love this town. And she drives off. So that was my uh, car pushing story. It was fantastic. Okay. Yeah, I like to think I helped compared to the uh, three gigantic Italian dudes that showed up. <laughs> I can remember them. They were just like these, you can just imagine like some three like just uh, gym like heavy Italian guys. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> the expectations of each role are the norms that people use to guide their own actions and in the role and use to police each other's behavior in their respective roles. Police are just sort of understand. Uh, okay. Associated with, associated with each role are two, are thus two sets of roles, if you will. Constitutive roles and regulative norms. Okay, so here we're really getting somewhere. Consti constitutive and regulative. The constitutive rules outline what sort of behaviors count as acting in the role at all. The regulative norms outline the standards for acting well in the role. So we've got evaluation here. Stereotypes can contribute to the content of both sorts of rules. All right, so it's like you can put this in, I mean, I'm, this is going to be bringing this right into like my area, but like uh, if you, in terms of uh, logical semantics, um, you've got, you can describe the rules of logic as constitutive rules, what it is to be following a logic. And then you can talk about uh, how to, use logic well to prove things and that's something very different because being a good logician has nothing to do with just knowing the rules you have to know the rules but it has nothing to do with being good at it or what it is to use the logic to use it well is to understand how to play the game and so this is the same sort of distinction but in a social context what it is to const constitute a social role and what it is to uh, execute that role as a, uh, in terms of regulative norms Okie doke. Stereotypes can contribute to the content of both sorts of rules. In our example, because gender stereotypes played a role in the assignment of roles, but yeah, the roles are themselves inflected by gender. How do we spell out how they are inflected? My preferred way of capturing that is to say that we have a further partitioning of the roles. There is the role of woman driver and the role of man pusher and boy pusher. The norms govern 
governing woman driver could be different from those of a man driver in that context, and the norms governing large man pusher, frail man pusher, and boy pusher differ. There are other ways to think about that. For example, we could say that for the roles to be inflected by gender is for the woman to play both roles at once, driver and woman. When there is a conflict in what we what one should do, we could say that one trumps the other, depending on the context or even always. Charlotte Witt suggests this picture. We then have, we then play multiple roles, but gender is a mega role that trumps all others. I do not think we need to settle which route is better here. What precisely is the content of the associated norms and from where do they derive? The answer to that will vary from context to context. When we enter a communal context such as a cocktail party, we bring with us social, a so, bring us social maps from the other context we have traveled in. These social maps correspond to a set of assumptions about one's own place in a social encounter as well as of others in that encounter. Here, Hegel's ideas, ooh, referencing the original 1807, about subjectification and objectification inspire. Just as for Hegel, one's consciousness form, just as for Hegel, one consciousness forms a conception of itself and the other it encounters, and it acts as if those conceptions are valid, so people entering and encountering with other people bring with them sets of assumptions about their own role in that encounter and that of others they meet. This sets these sets of assumptions need not be conscious, although sometimes they are. The social roles with associated norms for behavior and cars behavior correspond to a social map. These social maps have locations which are available roles to play in the context, and with each location comes norms for behavior for the occupant and for others. The social locations are fully intersectional in that each feature that is socially significant in the context inflects the constraints and enablements for the occupant of that location. The relationship between the constraints and enablements are the associated norms is akin to the relationship between the constitutive rules for a game as chess and the norms for playing well. If you flout the constitutive rules, you are not playing well. No, you're not playing at all. Yes, if you, you are not playing at all if you flout the constitutive rules. If you flout the norms, you are simply playing badly. Yeah, that's... This is the exact same uh, example that gets used uh, in the semantics literature, so... Yay, I got something right! <laughs> The constraints and enablements define what you can do or not do in the context because they set the intelligibility frame for a person's actions. This is key. Actions that require the hermeneutical participation of others for success may be blocked by this very intelligibility frame, as we shall see shortly. So my suggestion is that stereotypes and stereotyping, as part of ideologies, contribute in various ways to the formations of our intersectional social identities, but then also to the constraints and enablements we have on our actions in the various contexts we find ourselves in. And as a social category is defined by the constraints and enablements on the behavior of its members, stereotypes and stereotyping contributes to the construction of social categories in these ways as well. Stereotypes and group membership do not dictate every context, however. Personal relationships and knowledge of each other can change what features are salient in a context. The knowledge that the woman is the strongest of them all, for example, can override the operation of the stereotype of women as weak. Likewise, the knowledge that the frail man is the best driver and the other two are terrible can make salient not only the license to operate the car, but ability to operate it. Stereotypes are most likely to be operating in the context where people do not know each other very well or at all and are judging on the basis of social groups they take people to belong to and features they take them to have. Knowing each other, of course, not, is of course not merely a matter of spending time, to time together, but of treating each other as individuals epistemically as opposed to mere instances of groups. Yeah. I mean, you do what you can when you're meeting someone new. You try to pick up signals about something about them. And those are inherently stereotypical things. Um, but, yeah, just because, uh, but you, you're doing the best you can, but once you get to know someone better, then you actually know what their strengths are. If it happens to be physical strength. Because uh, I, I ran into, who was that? She was a power lifter. I knew a power lifter once. It's just like, okay, she's just incredibly strong. So, <laughs> yeah. All right, action impossible. When a person gets conferred a status, certain actions become possible that were not possible before, and some may no longer be possible. 
For example, when a person gets conferred the institutional status of instructor for a class, they are entitled to set assignments, grade them, and report the grades to university authorities at the end of the term. Some actions that may have been possible in the past are, no, are so no longer on pain of losing the status, such as asking a student in the class out on a date. <laughs> I don't know. He can still seems to get away with that quite often nowadays, although it causes a lot of trouble. Other actions get blocked out as unintelligible. Consider, for example, the philosophy professor who appears to be asking a student if the student will permit the professor to take the class. Consider a philosopher who appears to be asking a student if the student will permit the professor to take the class. I don't understand that. The, does the student want to take the class? All right, whatever. Figure it out. The range of available interpretations include that there is something, there's some misunderstanding, that the professor is having a mental health, yeah, mental health episode, that the professor is mocking the student, but the interpretation where the first professor is earnestly asking to be permitted to the class is blocked out. Yes, that makes no sense, and that's why I didn't think it made any sense. Um, I once did break into a class, though. I found a loophole in the uh, sign-up system when I was an undergrad. I took a grad-level course, and the teacher was like, how are you signed up for the course? You need my permission. I was like, yeah, I'm not telling you, but is it okay? And he was like, yeah, it's okay. I say, okay, no harm, no foul. But yeah, um, now, the question is, what is the um, blocked out as unintelligible here? What, what, what is the nature of this unintelligibility? Now, it's not like completely unintelligible because as they said, maybe they're having a mental health episode. Um, that might actually be... Uh... So it's not unintelligible. It's just completely out of the stereotypical context is really what it is. So it's not... Um... It's just so far removed from the context or the normal context, or I guess, what would the context be? What would be considered normal here? Um, I'm not sure. It's not that it's blocked out. It's just that it, it becomes um, outside the role of a professor and student. It'd be, it would be, it'd have to be reversed. And so, in some sense, it is role-breaking. It's not blocked out. It's role-breaking. Um yeah, on pain of losing the status. See, in some sense, this is not losing the status, such as asking a student now, because then you get uh, sanctioned by the university. But this is sort of uh, dropping the status uh, in a different way. Okay, so that's still reasonable. I just didn't get the uh, terminology. I'm in, okay, continuing. I'm interested in the cases where the status of a person in a context makes actions either impossible or unintelligible. Yeah, see, this is where the work is going to be. How do we uh, cash out? this sort of impossibility or unintelligibility. And I characterize categorical, categorical injustice as a type of injustice where an individual is institutionally entitled to perform an action, but their action is blocked by their placement in a category. There's a certain mismatch between what the person is entitled to do and what they are able to do given their placement. The paradigm examples involve a mismatch between an institutional entitlement and communal status. All right someone makes it looks like it's gonna make sense let's see what they say consider the following scenario an engineer oversees a large construction project that has the institutional authority to assign work the whole group shows up for the first day of work tom shows up late when he enters the room the engineer says to tom you will take section c tom says we'll see about that i'll discuss it with the engineer he does not realize that the engineer meant to be meant to be giving an order because the engineer is a woman a variation is such that he understands very well that he has been given an order, but he does not heed it as he does not respect the authority of the engineer because they are a woman. Let us zero in on the first sort of case. Do we want to say that the engineer gave an order even though Tom did not understand it as such, or do we want to say that the up uptake partly determines the nature of the action? I am inclined to say that the order was issued, but the lack of uptake made it unsuccessful. As Austin, Searle, Bach, and others stress, Various things can go awry with the speech acts, but not all of them make it the case that we do not perform the intended speech act at all. And here is an or here an order is analogous with the other speech acts, such as promising. If you promise to re return my car, but do not do it, you have failed in your obligation, as opposed to not having undertaken the obligation after all. Similarly, if the engineer orders the worker to perform a certain task and the worker does not perform it, then the worker has failed in their obligation. So there are two sorts of cases when the worker understands it as an order and does not follow it, and when the worker does not understand it as an order at all. The former case is a straightforward case of failing your obligation. 
What about the case when the worker does not understand it as an order? Compare the case when Abba lends Bello money and Bello says, I'll pay you back. Abba knows of Bello's reputation for never paying people back and does not think they will ever see the money. Sure enough, Bello does not pay back the money. In fact, he has never he never had never intended to do so. He made an insincere gesture and Abba took it to be insincere. However, it is clear that the type of gesture that was insincere and taken to be insincere was a promise. A variation on the case above is that perhaps closer to the case of the engineer's orders, we want to understand what we want to understand is a case where Bello undertakes the obligation sincerely but is not believed, because part, bleh, perhaps because of their track record. But such a case is clear cut. Bello makes a promise even though they are not believed. If they are brought the money back a week later and said that's the money I promised to pay you back, Abbo would be pleasantly surprised, not because they got a windfall out of the blue, but be rather because Bello has been sincere when Abba thought they were not. Let us return to our case of the engineer and the order. It may matter less whether we want to say that what we have is an unsuccessful order that, or that the engineer does not manage to issue an order at all. In that way, we may avoid taking a stand on some theoretical issues regarding the mechanics of speech acts. What is clear is that the engineer does not manage to issue a successful order. The lack of success, however, is however not a fluke. It is part of a pattern. And we should let a light on what prevents the worker from understanding the order as an order. That is a part of the project of this paper. Yeah, there's always a fun, there's always a, there's a bunch of fun stories on online about like, don't you know who I am? I was like, I'm going to talk to the manager, and they're like, okay, you're talking to the manager. It's like a bunch of these stories happen. It's like you're. I want to talk to the owner. I am the owner. <laughs> The key idea is that for many actions we perform, they are only successful if they are understood by the people we are engaging with as we intend them. Many speech acts are only successful if the audience interprets them as they are intended. For example, as an order that is not understood by the recipient as an order is unhappy to use Austin's language. I want to offer an account of how actions can be systematically be made unhappy by the intended interpretation of the action being blocked by how the performer is socially constructed. Alright, so... Ideas from philosophy of language can help us to articulate how our actions can be systematically thwarted in a particular way, in particular the Gricean notion of common ground as developed by Robert Stallnacker and David Lewis's idea of keeping score in a language game. On Stallnacker's view, the common ground is in a conversational context is a set of propositions or beliefs that are taken for granted by the participants in the conversation. Each conversational move changes that set as propositions are added or subtracted. None of this need be conscious. Consider a context with only three people, Alba, Ben, and Chris. Alma, Ben, and Chris. Alba is a Latina woman, Ben is an African-American man, and Chris is a genderqueer Caucasian-American person. Ben and Chris are both philosophy professors, and Alma cleans their offices and is a nanny for Ben's kids. The three of them are having a conversation in the hallway in the philosophy department about Trump's immigration policies. At the beginning of the conversation, the three participants place each other on the location of, on a social map. Each location comes with constraints and enablements for the participant, but these constraints and enablements also offer the frame of intelligibility for their speech. These are the assumptions taken for granted in the conversation, <coughs> or the Stalnockerian common ground. The common ground sets the intelligibility and permissibility conditions for the conversational moves. For example, if Alma appears to be saying something supportive of Trump's immigration policies, Ben and Chris assume they have misunderstood her, given that her identity in the context includes being a Latina. The Stalnockerian common ground blocks it as an interpretation of what Alma is saying. I am suggesting that a similar thing happens in the more general case of action contexts, where interlocutors' interpretation of the intended action is required for the action to be successful, the intended interpretation can be blocked for systematic and unjust reasons. Making use of an analogous idea of a common ground for action and context, we can say that by placing a person on a social map, the subject also place certain assumptions on the common ground, that is, the set of shared assumptions in the context. The, place of, the placing of people on a social map is not always a simple affair that happens with, without struggle. Often the people in the, encountering, in the encounter bring incompatible social maps, and sometimes and some negotiation happens before the people set in, settle into their roles. Some contexts are even too short for anyone to settle into a role. There are attempts at placing each other onto social maps, but is contested from start to finish. 
The unfortunate aspect of the metaphor of a social map is that it suggests we apply a fixed map that remains static through the encounter, but a better way to think of it is that each action moves the co in the context changes the shared moves in the context changes the shared assumptions the common ground a little bit. The social map is then a dynamic entity of changing ever so slightly with each move in the context. In each and every context we travel, there are certain features that are socially salient, and people need to have those features get conferred onto them and in an intersectional status con consisting in constraints and enablements on their action because being placed in a category is to have certain assumptions made about them such that potential actions become unintelligible or impossible. Certain other actions also become impermissible and performing them risks sanctions, although they are intelligible and possible to perform. All right, so basically you try to pe peg people and uh, understand what they are and who they are and what they're capable of and that way you can sort of understand what they're saying and uh, maybe draw on their expertise or lack thereof to uh, do something in your conversation I mean that makes sense um, now the question here is I guess what's gonna happen here is by pegging people of course you sometimes you get people wrong and then you do not take them seriously enough when they have that uh they have skills or knowledge that you don't, um, or you don't expect. Um, I make use of this quite often. People don't expect me to be able to argue for things that I know how to argue for. I was arguing. <laughs> yeah. So I know how to argue for some very weird things. I do, and maybe this is a fault of mine, I get some glee watching certain philosophers' arguments, just them start having to backtrack very quickly when their arguments start failing when talking to me. So, we'll see. <coughs> so let's see what this categorical injustice is. I have outlined above how placement in social categories frames the inter action between people in context, how it sets the frame of intelligibility and possibility for their actions, as well as, in, as, well as permissibility. It is now time to focus on the cases that result in an injustice. The main idea is this, to perform an action successfully, having some specific features is needed. While some person is entitled to perform the action, they are thwarted in their attempt, their effort to perform it because they are placed in a category and the assumption about members of that category is that they lack one of the re requisite features. Because the intended interpretation of the action is required for the action to be successful for the action to be successful, this assumption blocks the intended interpretation and the person cannot perform the action successfully. More formally, to perform A successfully having features F1 through Fn is needed. S is entitled to perform A but is thwarted in their effort to do so because they are placed in category C and the assumption about members of C is that they are not Fi for some I. That assumption blocks the interpretation of S's actions, and as the intended action is required to successfully perform the action, S is not able to perform A successfully. This is the cognitional version of categorical injustice. There will be another case where the intended interpretation is not blocked, but instead, instead not recognized and the interlocutor resists the agent. That is certainly an injustice, but requires a different analysis. I term that one the recognitional one. Let's apply this to the two engineering cases above. Case one, the worker does not understand the action as an order. To perform A requires the authority to do so. E has the institutional authority. However, E is taken to be a member of group G and the stereotype of group G is that they do not have the institutional authority to perform A. W takes E not to have the authority to perform A and the interpretation of the action where E is issued and order is blocked. This is the cog cognitional version of categorical injustice compared with the second case. Compare it with the second sort of case. Okay, basically, it says, look, you're the wrong sort of person, and therefore, um, when you hear what they're saying, it doesn't process like it, it normally would if it came out of somebody else's mouth, where you were expecting to hear um, the order be issued. Um, you won't, so when someone said it, it just doesn't, in some sense, it doesn't process to you. Um, because why would somebody like that be saying anything so you don't even recognize it? You just hear it as sort of, um, like some just sort of a weird speech or some sort of nonsense, I guess. Okay. Case two, the worker understands it as an order. 
In the case where the worker understands the engineer is giving an order, but does not heed it, requires a different sort of analysis. No, I, I don't know. Oh, this is, I think this is wrong. And understands the um, the speaker as giving an order, not the engineer. If they, if the person knew that the woman was the engineer, the, this one problem would arise. But okay. Here it is not that the interpretation of the action as an order is blocked by the social construction of of the engineer, but rather the engineer's communal status as a woman blocks her being recognized as having the institutional authority that she has. That's right. The worker does not understand that she is the engineer. For it is not enough to have the authority to issue the order. One's authority needs to be recognized. And, and here the features associated with being a woman include not having the authority to issue an order, and the engineer's attempt at issuing a successful order is thwarted. The recognitional version of categorical injustice more formally thus. To perform, a, to perform A requires the institutional authority to do so. E has the institutional authority. However, W takes E to be a member of group G and not, and not merit such an institutional authority due to that group membership. Thus, W does not recognize E's authority to perform A and resists it. What is injustice about categorical injustice? The injustice lies in the fact that the agent is entitled to perform the action but is thwarted in their effort because of how they are classified or placed. It is a distinct sort of injustice perpetrated against a person through socially constructing them as a member of a group, of a social group, where that social construction undercuts their ability to perform the action that they are entitled to. There is thus a mismatch between what a person is institutionally entitled to do and what they are able to do, given how they are socially constructed. Note that a person can be subject to, a, to categorical injustice, but thereby saved from committing some morally heinous act. Consider a military officer who orders her men to kill innocent children and suffers recognitional categorical injustice, but is saved from bearing the responsibility from the death of innocent children. Um, yeah, so, I mean, the consequence of the thing doesn't have to be uh, ethical, of course. It just needs to be institutionally uh, permissible that the officer or engineer uh, gives the order. Right. Categorical injustice and ontic injustice. Uh, is there anything else to say? If anyone out, out there has questions, please let me know. I mean, there are viewers, so someone's listening. <laughs> but yeah, let me know if you have any questions about this. I will try to answer, but as I said, this is farther out from my normal stuff, so I do have uh, less chance of getting things right. Categorical injustice and ontic Justice. Catherine Jenkins has recently isolated a certain injustice that involves socially constructing a person as a member of a group, a certain group which she terms ontic injustice. Is categorical injustice a case of ontic injustice? On, Jen on Jenkins' account of being socially constructed, whether institutionally or communally, comes with constraints and enablements, and these constraints are, are unjust when there is a mismatch between what a person is morally entitled to do and what they are able to do given on how they are socially constructed. In the case of categorical injustice, however, more, not however, moreover, the mismatch is between what a person is institutionally entitled to do and what they are able to do given how they are socially constructed. Um, so, morally entitled versus institutional. Okay. So, despite the fact that both ontic injustice and categorical injustice involve a phenomenon where the social construction of an individual as a member of a group is implicated in an injustice, these two ways of highlighting how the social construction of people can involve an injustice complement each other rather than being rival theories. Um, yeah, because morally entitled and what they're able to do versus institutionally entitled. So, we've got a different sort of... Um, uh, institution versus moral, uh, so we've got different sorts of uh, institutions, the moral institution and then the uh, institution that is more abstract, or not, it's more general, it could be any sort of institution, like being part of an engineer, could be a part of a uh, university as the uh, teacher example above, but moral is a specific kind of uh, entitlement. All right. The role, <clears throat> the role, oh, hey, Fricker, the one thing I knew about. The role in discursive and testimonial injustice. I've offered a theory of how social construction of individuals results in an injustice that draws directly on the conferral story of the construction of social categories. The various accounts of epistemic and discursive injustice focus on specific harms that are epistemic or discursive, and some offer their own theories of what mechanisms that might be thought metaphysical contribute to the injustice, while others 
leave that open. I isolate, I isolate a way in which a specific action is thwarted, which can help an understanding of when a certain epistemic or discursive action is thwarted. There can, however, be harms and injustices that do not involve thwarted action, and categorical injustice is not meant to capture those. In this way, categorical injustice can play a role in, in cases of epistemic and discursive injustice, although an analysis of such cases of injustice may not be exhausted by tending to categorical injustice. Here below, I highlight how categorical injustice plays a role in some paradigm cases of epistemic and discursive injustice. To be sure, a theorist of those cases might reject my proposal and prefer another one because of the, the theoretical commitments that categorical injustice relies on, that is, the conferralist framework. An alternative framework would then have to be found to account for the distinctively metaphysical mechanisms. Yeah, this is definitely a metaphysical account because you're metaphysically um, getting because of the categorical nature of things. If it, you're, you have a problem because of a category, not um, some sort of social or epistemic thing, then you're going to have a categorical problem as a metaphysical problem. So it does, it is a little bit of a different spin than other things I've seen, which isn't much. <laughs> All right, Fricker. On Miranda Fricker's view, group-based prejudice regarding a speaker undercuts the success of speaker's testimony, even though the person is entitled to testify. So they're in, this would be an institutional entitlement, like your call to the stand as a citizen or as an expert witness. However, to testify, one must have credibility, which involves competence and trustworthiness. The prejudice regarding the group is that its members are untrustworthy or incompetent or both, and that is how the successful testimony of the speaker is thwarted. It is impossible for the speaker to testify and be believed. Testimonial injustice is thus clearly a case of the following phenomenon. To perform action A, having features F1, competence, and F2, trustworthiness, is needed. Speaker cis SIS is thwarted in their effort to perform A because they belong to group G, and the prejudice about group G is that they are not F1 and or not F2. This is a case of cogn cognitional categorical injustice. Yeah, so this is the, uh, the this author's spin on these sort of other cases, which makes sense because this uh, metaphysics tends to be a little bit wider than uh, some of the other philosophical uh, things. So the fact that this is a more general account, again, as the author said, um, they'll be able to give accounts of the sort of these other injustices. But again, why would the other people want to take on the uh, burdens of the assumptions? So, but it is uh, to the author's credit if they can account for a bunch of different cases with minimal assumptions. Dotson. What about Christy Dotson's case of testimonial quieting? Testimonial quieting may seem to fit nicely in the, fit nicely the general framework. In order to speak, an agent needs to be given credibility that is competence and trustworthiness. And because of stereotypes about black women, where they are taken to be incompetent and or untrustworthy, their attempts to speak successfully are thwarted, even though they are entitled to perform that action. They are not seen to be capable of be being speakers, so there is no uptake when they attempt to speak. Testimonial quieting thus fits with the general framework offered. There can be cognitional and recognitional versions of categorical injustice at work in these sorts of cases. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking try to, I don't think it matters. I, I might be able to say something more about the recognitional, um, injustice here, or the, recog yeah, the recognitional version of, of this thing, but I don't think it helps much. Okay, Langton. Ray Langton's paradigm case of elocutionary disablement involves a person's attempting at refusing sex, but her refusal is silenced. The silencing in question is not locutionary. She is not gagged or her mic turned off. She utters the word no and attempts thereby to thereby refuse sex, but her word is not taken up as signifying refusal. Does this case fit our framework? Yes, here is how. The person belongs to a group of to group women and associated with the group in this context are stereotype of a woman are like and what they want, as well as norms for how to act in this context. Women in sexual context are taken to have some features, F1 and F2. For example, women in sexual context are taken to want sex, yet not want to offer themselves, but rather to be taken by the men. If Langton is right, then the mainstream heterosexual porn industry perpetuates the stereotype. 
In order for the woman to be able to perform the action of refusal, she has to be able to report on her desires. In this case, any speech act that entails that she does not desire sex goes against the stereotype of what women are like in the context and is disabled, blocked as an interpretation. More formally, a person is taken to belong to a group G and the stereotype of members of G is that they have feature F. Any potential speech act that entails that the person does not have feature F is disabled. This is a case of cognitional categorical injustice. Yeah, it's treated as nonsense because the person is not recognized to be able to speak in that way. The woman is not, the woman, uh, no, the person is not, uh, uh, this recognition or cognitional? Um, okay, no, no, it is, um, yeah, because this is the cognitional one where it's nonsense. The recognition one says, look, you're just not that person, but I understand you. Okay. The woman is not able to exercise her capability as a speaker and be heard for what she means in the context. She can only assume the role of prop in the sexual game that is the man's fulfilling his desire. Anything she attempts to say or do in the context gets interpreted through the interpretive framework of the porn roles. Her attempt to refuse is merely an encouraging move in the courting ritual. Yeah, damned if you do and damned if you don't. Kukla. Rebecca Kukla's paradigm case involves the phenomenon that a person is thwarted in her attempt to play a certain role, a certain role by her group membership, but instead of illocutionary disablement, we have a different unintended illocutionary force. A woman foreman has the institutional authority to issue an order, but does not have the adequate communal standing to issue it, as and is instead taken to be issuing a request. Here we can say that in order to issue orders, a person needs to be taken to have authority over the receiver. A woman, in virtue of her group, membership is taken to have features incompatible with having authority and thus her attempt to exercise that authority is thwarted. Her communal status in the context involves being a woman and the features associated with being a woman undercut her ability to exercise her institutional role and issue an order. Instead she is taken to issue a request. The illocutionary force of her utterance is different from what she intended. This case fits nicely in the framework because of how the foreman is socially constructed. She is unable to perform certain actions she is institutionally entitled to perform and is instead taken to perform other unintended actions. This is a case of cognitional categorical injustice. Yeah, so unlike the one above where the person is taking it to be nonsense, they sort of reinterpret it to be something that fits with the uh, preconceived social roles. Um, so instead of just saying, I don't understand what the person is saying, they're saying, well, I just thought they meant something else, which is clearly not what they meant uh, on the institutional or on reflection, but it's sort of a discounting of what uh, the person said, um, as opposed to just uh, not a blatant misunderstanding or lack of understanding. Okay. Conclusion, I had offered a theory of how social construction can result in an injustice that is distinctively metaphysical. I have labeled this injustice categorical injustice and isolated two versions of it, cognitional and recognitional. All right, so what I was going to say earlier was um, we've got a sort of a de re and a de dicto. So it's like the de dicto is, not is the recognitional. You don't understand what people are saying. And the uh, de re is not understanding the object itself of what's going on. But anyway, don't know if that makes any difference in this context. I've compared categorical injustice to a form of metaphysical injustice recently theorized by Catherine Jenkins as well as discussed how categorical injustice can play a role in discursive and epistemic injustice. Oh, okay, and that's it. That's a short conclusion. It's kind of nice. Um, yeah. Okie dokie. Um, anything else I have to say about this? Uh, do I have anything further to say about the uh, de dicto, de re distinction here? This just sort of breaks down along those lines. I, I don't think it actually helps any. It just struck me as um, the recognitional uh, de, -dic de dicto is like not understanding. So it's like uh, Clark Kent and Superman. You don't recognize Clark Kent as Superman. So that's it. So if um, Clark Kent would say something in a like that Superman would say you wouldn't you wouldn't understand it in the way that Superman said it now if they also said something that only Superman would say it would just be confusing to you that Clark Kent was saying something that only Superman would say so that would be the cognitional version and then the recognition one would be like well you're not Superman so you can't make that claim so okay but yeah so we've got a uh, de re de dicto sort of a uh, distinction here Yeah, and roles um, per 
persona gets uh, brought into that. So, and that's kind of where roles is. So you get the object and role. So there's a known sort of a parallel where you've got the uh, the role understanding as uh, like Superman as a role that Clark Kent can assume, or the other way around, depending what you put where you put your uh, superhero ontology. Anywho, um, yeah, I don't have anything else to say. Of course, not my area, so I don't have any background enough background to bear to bring to bear on this but otherwise it was kind of nice i liked i mean that i actually knew something about the distinction made here about the constitutive and then the uh strategic uh distinction here what it is to to be con constituted by a role and then the norm of what it is to do to be in that role well and that makes a big that is a fundamental distinction in other areas so that is a good distinction to bring into this area i like that a bunch i mean just that my own biases of course because i like that distinction yeah that's over here um so this is good uh yep yeah, all right everyone out there last chance to ask a question or a comment otherwise i'll be back tomorrow morning with another paper all right Thanks for listening, and have a good night. Stay safe, everyone. Please do. And uh, that's it. Bye-bye.